All right, this is as good as it's getting, so I'll just talk a little bit louder than I normally would. All right, so I'm Nick. I'm going to be your instructor. Um, today is going to be pretty relaxed, pretty different than the rest of the classes. Um, we're going to go over the syllabus, and then we're going to do like a real quick review of some of the most important topics from 151, and then also a little bit of review of the relevant calculus you're going to use in this class. Um, I'll start with a quick Q&A. Uh, what should you guys call me? The answer is Nick. If you call me Professor Pittman, you're wrong because I'm not a professor. If you call me Dr. Pittman, I don't have a PhD. I'm a grad student, so I'm not a doctor. If you call me Mr. Pittman, you're wrong because I'm not 40, I'm 23. And if you call me, like, I've gotten some emails addressed as Nicholas Pittman. Like, you're not my mom, so. <laughs> uh, what's my favorite part about teaching physics? It's probably that no matter how ridiculously lost you guys might be, if you're totally in the can and you come to me, in 10 minutes I can get you back up to speed. It just requires a little bit of poking and prodding and me figuring out exactly what you're confused about. A related question is, what is my favorite kind of question to be asked? And it's the ones that make you feel the dumbest when you're asking them. So when you guys are like, uh, that topic from two lectures ago that I totally should have gotten, and it's coming up again now, and I thought I had it, but I absolutely don't, and I kind of don't want to reveal that I don't know it, that's when I want you to ask the most, okay? You're going to help out a lot of people in the class who might have the same question. Um, that's just universally true. Um, so please, no fear with the questions here. Even if you don't quite know what you're asking, that's sort of my specialty. If you're totally, totally confused, have no idea how to even phrase the question, that's the best time to ask. For doing homework, if you don't know anybody in this class, feel free to pop a message in the Discord like looking for a group. I want you guys to work together on your homeworks, okay? There's no point in sitting there being super confused, not knowing what to do, and then just looking up the answer from Chegg and punching it in. I want you guys to talk it over with your friends and figure out how to get the answer from each other as much as you can. Now, obviously, don't copy each other, but if you have to get hauled by one of your friends, and then eventually, as a result of that haul, you sort of understand what's going on, that's good. Another thing, if you get a topic in this class, like if you figure it out, and one of your friends doesn't, or some guy next to you who you don't know doesn't get it, don't flex on them. Be, be like as gentle as you can in your explanations with them. Try and help them out. Use your powers for good if you get it and someone else doesn't. Another thing, don't feel dumb, or don't worry if you feel dumb while learning certain things in this class. If you guys remember how absolutely impossible it was to learn about pi or negative numbers or algebra, how ridiculously hard that was the first time you saw it, but now it's a piece of cake, that's the way some things are going to go in here. Okay? So don't worry if it makes you feel dumb or you're confused, because everything does to everybody. To me, it was hard for me to learn algebra. It was hard for you to learn algebra. So the only reason I know how to do this stuff is because I've done it before. Okay. So there's a lot of words that you don't know what they mean. Uh, the math is one thing I want to address. So this is a vector calculus-based course, but most of you are in Calc 2. So that doesn't work out in practice, but what's, what's uh, good for you guys is that a lot of the vector calc stuff that you do in this class, it actually doesn't involve any vector calc. We're going to um, do two things called Gauss's Law and Amper's Law, and by doing some appropriate choosing of surfaces, you'll see that there's actually nothing more than about Calc 1 level stuff in here. I know there's a couple people who have not completed Calc 1 in here. You'll be okay, but come up to me and I can show you a little bit of what you'll need to know. Um, in practice, the challenge in here isn't going to be going to be doing tough integrals. It's going to be knowing, do I have to use an integral at all for this problem, or can I use an algebraic equation? And I'm going to go over that a little bit today. <laughs> all right. First topic we're going to do, and again, back row, can you hear me okay if I talk at this volume? Yeah? Okay. All right, first topic I'm going to do is systems of equations, which is something that you learned a long time ago, but I want to get everybody on the same page because it'll save everyone time. 
So for systems of equations, there's a golden rule. I don't know, have you guys heard this before? Make sure you have the same number of equations as you have unknowns. Have you guys heard that before? Who hasn't heard that before? A fair share of people. Okay, so I'm just gonna go a quick review. This is a process that'll get you through a system fast instead of bumbling around until you happen upon the answer. Okay, so let's say I give you the following system of equations. Oops. Let's say I give you the system negative 3x plus y equals minus 1 and 4x plus y equals minus 8. Okay, if you look at this and you're going to get here a lot, you count how many equations do you have, which is 2, and you look at how many different unknown variables you have, which is x is 1, y is another. So you have two equations, two unknowns. Whenever you reach this point in a problem, you are guaranteed home free done. It's just going to be some annoying algebra to get the answers. You'll know what both x and y are. Okay, so once you get here in a problem, you can sigh, say, I've got it. I'm going to have to truck through some algebra, but I've got it. Okay? And a systematic way you can solve these equations is as follows. You're going to declare one variable as a variable that you hate and you never want to see again. And in this case, I'm going to choose y as a variable that I do not want to see again in my equation. And you're going to rearrange one of the equations so that it says that variable that you hate equals other stuff. So in this case, I'm going to rearrange the first equation into y equals minus 1 plus 3x. Okay? Now, in the second equation, everywhere you see this variable that you hate, you just replace it with whatever you set it equal to. So in this case, in the second equation, everywhere I see y, I just replace it with this. Okay? Now look, I have one equation with only one variable in it. It's a simple algebraic equation. Okay, I have negative 1 plus 7x equals negative 8. 7x equals negative 7. Therefore, x equals minus 1. Okay, this process is going to be extraordinarily useful because it works even if they're quadratic equations, um, which you'll have a lot in this class due to the quadratic nature of electric force. Once you have x equals negative 1, this is where also people tend to get stuck, you plug it back into either of these two equations to get the value of y. So in this case, I'll plug it into the first equation. Okay, 3 plus y equals negative 1. And then move the 3 over to get y equals minus 4. Okay, that's called back substitution. And again, I'm going a lot faster here. I won't go this fast in our actual lectures. This is just a review. Okay, so again, this process, you declare a variable that you absolutely hate. You never want to see it again. And then everywhere in that second equation, you just stuff it in. You stuff in the stuff that it's equal to because you never want to see y again. And that eliminates a uh, variable from that equation. Okay, second topic I'm going to go over is everybody's favorite F equals MA, which caused you a lot of suffering last semester. And again, I'm going to be going much, much faster today than I would in another day. So if you, if you like, can't copy the notes down, just you can just look at them online. But mostly it's the understanding I want to get across. Okay, so an example of an F equals MA problem is if you have a five kilogram object by the way, can you guys read like the number in the square in the back row? Just barely probably? Yeah. Okay. I'll need to remember to write a little bigger here. And let's say I declare I have a 50 Newton applied force and a 10 Newton opposing force. And I ask you, what's the acceleration of this object? You know, you guys have done this 100 times. Okay. F equals MA is really a set of instructions in a thought bubble saying you take right arrows minus left arrows
and you just put a giant equal sign after that, and then you set it equal to MA. Okay. So in this case, your right arrow is 50, your left arrow is 10, and you just put a giant equal sign after all your arrows are gone, and you set it equal to the mass of the object, which is 5, times the acceleration. And technically, you'll see this written as a sum of F equals MA. Okay, you look, you have one equation, one unknown. Uh, if you solve this, you get A equals 8. Okay, but a question is going to come up here, and this is why I'm going over this, because we're going to be haunted by this all semester. The question is, why does it say sum of F? Or if it says sum of F, then why is there a minus sign in front of 10? Okay, and it's because technically, the instruction is you add up all the force arrows together, okay? And when you add arrows, if you have an arrow going to the right of strength 50, and you add an arrow that goes backwards 10, you go 50 to the right and 10 back to the left for an overall of 40 to the right, right? So you can sort of package this into the phrase, forces add as vectors. They add like arrows do. So even though you're adding up the arrows, there's going to be minus signs whenever an arrow points in the opposite direction of another arrow. Okay? So they add as vectors. And my way of approaching these problems is always to always work with the size of the force, the magnitudes of the forces, and then insert the minus signs by hand as I'm writing the equation, just by looking at it and noting which forces point in the backwards direction. Okay. Another thing I want to point out about this equation is that it's a vector equation, meaning that it's saying that an arrow on the left, the sum of all forces arrow, which in this case is 40 to the right, equals m times the a arrow, which doesn't just communicate that a equals 8 meters per second squared, but it also communicates that the force arrow and the a arrow are in the same direction, right? This equation says these two arrows are equal. So if one arrow is pointing to the right, the other one sure as hell is also pointing to the right. You can also interpret that as saying the x components of the two arrows are equal and the y components of the two arrows are equal. So if you remember, if you ever had something like this, you got a second equation from the up arrows minus the down arrows was equal to m times the, like the vertical acceleration. That's coming from that interpretation, that you set the x components of the arrows equal to each other and the y components of the arrows equal to each other. And we're going to see this things adding as vectors and vector equations a hell of a lot in here. Okay, another example I wanted to quickly go over is if instead of a 50 newtons force, you had a diagonal force of 50 newtons let's say at an angle of 30 degrees, okay? If you're worried about the left and right acceleration, you can't just do 50 minus 10 because they don't point in the same direction. You're going to have to break up the diagonal arrow into a left and right arrow and an up and down arrow, right? And the way you're going to do this is with trig. This side will be 50 sine 30, and this side will be 50 cosine 30. So I've broken up this diagonally upwards arrow into a right arrow and an up arrow. And now whenever I'm doing my F equals MA stuff, looking at the arrows and writing right arrows minus left arrows, I use this arrow in the right-left equation and this arrow in the up-down equation. And again, the main thing I want you guys to get out of this is that if things are pointing diagonally and you're trying to do x component, or you need to use the x components 
of those diagonal arrows. You can't just add the sizes of the arrows together. They add up as arrows, so you have to break them up if they're diagonal to figure out how they add. We're going to be doing a lot of this next class when we talk about electric force. And again, just as an example, let's say if I wanted to write the vertical equation for this diagram, the instruction is all up arrows with plus signs and then all down arrows with minus signs. So here's an up arrow, 50 sine 30. Here's another up arrow, normal force. Here's an arrow pointing down, so it comes with a minus sign, right? Because you're adding up the upwards arrows plus the downwards arrows. So you subtract off the size of the downwards arrows. And then you would set it equal to m times the y acceleration. OK, now we're going to get to, I'll let you guys copy that down for a second. But again, I'm flying like way faster than I normally will, just because there's a lot to review. OK, now we come to the main thing I wanted to go over today, was, which was integrals. So everyone fears the calc-based physics class, but my understanding is you guys probably didn't do too much calc last semester. You might have found the area under a couple trapezoids, but you probably didn't actually do too much calc. Am I correct? Okay, That's, it's sort of going to change here, not by much. Again, it's not going to eat you alive, but we are going to be doing some actual calc. Okay, So I'm going to show you when you actually need to use integrals versus when you don't have to. That is going to be the main difficulty in this class, getting faked out into, crap, I need to integrate here versus, no, I actually don't need to integrate here. Okay, so let me ask you guys a question. You learned two formulas for work. One was work equals force times distance, maybe times cosine theta, but we're going to ignore that for now. And then you also learned work equals integral of force dx. Think to yourselves for a moment, when do you have to use the integral? When can you use the one on the left? And when do you have to use the integral form? Take a second and think. Okay, an answer would be you cannot use this form and you have to use the integral form when the force changes depending on what x you're at. Okay. The pen has. Oh, there we go. Okay. Or I'll say when f is different at each value of x. Okay, I'm going to box this in red even because it's that crucial to this class. Okay, For an example, if I told you a force acts from x equals 1 to x equals 3 and is of size 10 newtons the whole time, you can just use the formula on the left because the force is the same at each x. But if instead I told you the force is 12x squared, and you're pushing an object from x equals 1 to x equals 3, you cannot use the left-hand formula because the force changes depending on where you are in the push. And it's sort of fail-safe because if you were to just try and plug in for f, you would have no idea what number you would even put in there. right? Do you use the force at where you started the push or at the end of the push? You don't know. So in that case, you would have to use the integral so to compute the total work, you would be integrating the force, which is 12x squared dx from x equals 1 to x equals 3. Um, if you do a power rule, 
this would come out to 4x cubed evaluated at 3 versus 1, which is going to be some pretty awful number. Did I do it here? No. So it's going to be some big number. Okay? That red box is going to be crucial for us because as you get further away from an electrically charged object, we're going to find that the force gets smaller. So we're going to be using this all the time. Okay, next thing, potential energy and work. This tends to be really confusing for people, and uh, once again, we're going to be using this a lot. You guys have probably heard of how outlets have voltages, right? 120 volt outlet wall socket. That's related to potential energy, and we're going to be spending most of this class studying voltage. Okay? So it really helps to have a solid understanding of potential energy and work for the rest of this class. Okay? Here's something new that you haven't heard before. Things hate being at places with high potential energy. Okay? Equivalently, high potential energy is places where things hate being. And this is getting boxed in three different colors. Because as you'll see, this is one of the, actually I'd say it's the biggest concept in all of physics. Things hate being at places of high potential energy. You're going to see this everywhere. And again, you're going to see it a lot in this class. And if you don't internalize this, it'll style on you. Okay, an example is the classic, oops. Example is the classic ball on a hill. Okay, if you have the ball up on the hill, you're at high potential energy when you're at the tall section of the hill. Okay? And although it isn't really immediately clear, what it means to hate being at the high place on the hill, what you do know is that a ball on the hill will experience a force pushing it away from that high point of the hill. And the force pushes it from high PE down to an area of low PE. Things like being at places where their potential energy is low. And in this process, any PE that you lost, let's say you lost 40 joules of potential energy, the object gains that as kinetic energy. Okay, so if you lose 40, okay, if you start at 100 joules of PE, you end up at 60 joules of PE, your object now has 40, joul 40 joules more of kinetic energy than it did when it was at the top of the hill. Oops. Come on. These PowerPoint templates that I was given are truly horrifying sometimes. Please. Okay, there we go. Okay, a related formula that you're going to use a lot in this class is that the final kinetic energy of the object is the initial kinetic energy plus the work that has been injected into the object. And the work injected into the object will be often coming from losing potential energy. Okay, this is another thing I'm going to box in three colors. A 
again, how you would use this formula is if your kinetic energy at the top of the hill was zero joules, you weren't moving, you fell down 40 joules of potential energy. That did 40 joules of work on the object, right? As it fell down to lower potential energy, gravity was injecting energy into the object again. So the work injected is positive 40. Therefore, at the bottom of the hill, your Ke final is positive 40 joules of kinetic energy, okay? Something that this has in common with the F equals MA example is that the difficulty will come from minus signs in this formula. Knowing whether the work injected when an electron moves up a voltage is positive or negative, that's going to be a key point in this class. Again, I would say it's the most important point in the class. Another point is that work injected can sometimes be negative if there's an energy robbery going on. Usually you talk about that from friction in physics one. If friction does 20 joules of work, you're communicating that friction has robbed 20 joules of the initial kinetic energy that's no longer there in the final kinetic energy. As an example, if you started with 100 joules of kinetic energy, friction robbed you of 20 joules of kinetic energy, afterwards the object would only have 80 joules of kinetic energy. That subtraction comes about because the work done on the object was negative due to friction, okay? So I'll write a mnemonic here. If work injected is positive, that means object has gained energy. And if the work injected is negative, it means the object had energy stolen from it. Again, in the past, you've learned it as friction, but in this class, you're going to encounter it as going up or down voltages. This class ends at 110, right? Yeah, yeah okay, so we, I got like five more minutes. I'm usually going to go pretty close to the bell, um, but maybe sometimes on Fridays, I'll turn you loose early if I'm ahead. All right, very last topic is going to be dot products. Okay, we're going to learn cross products later. Have you guys learned cross products in 151? Yeah, you hate them? Yeah, we're going to be learning them. Magnetism uses them a lot. All right, so real quick, dot products. Okay. If you have two vectors, here's a question. If you have two vectors and you take a dot product, what do you get out, a vector or a number? That's something you're going to want to remember. If you dot product two vectors, it gives you a number out. Okay, and there are two ways to get this number. The way we're going to use most often is you take the size of vector A, so just its length, and then you're going to take, oops, and then you're going to take the size of vector b, irrespective of what direction it's pointing, and you're going to multiply it by the cosine of the angle between them. And the way you get that angle, this is another important thing, you don't write the vectors like this. That's for vector addition. To determine the angle, you need to write them like clock hands. So if here's a, here's b, here's theta. You're going to be doing this a lot in this class. <laughs> someone, someone got it. And then last thing, or one more thing, a second way you can do it occasionally is if you know the components of A and B, like their X components, their Y components, you're going to be doing the X component of vector A times the X component of vector B. And you're going to add on to that the y component of A times the y component of B. These are both valid ways, although we're going to use the first one more. 
Very, very last thing. Yeah, my, my whistle wasn't very loud. I can do that one, but it would shred the microphone. When the vectors point in the same direction, theta is 0, so cosine of theta is 1. So the special case is when a and b in the same direction, the cosine theta is 1, so a dot b is just the size of a times the size of b. And the other special case is when a and b point in opposite directions. b points to the right, a points to the left. In that case, theta is equal to 180 degrees. Cosine of 180 is negative 1. So a dot b simplifies to negative size of a, size of b. You're going to come to hate this case when we do uh, voltage from electric field. All right, that's all I got for today. Again, this was a lot faster.